A year ago this week, I flew up from New Mexico to Dallas to meet with the search team as we started the, the process of, of uh, us finalizing what church God had led us to and y'all uh, kind of entering into that process with us. So technically, this is our, uh, our, our van anniversary. I won't call it that anymore. Uh, so... But so what happened on that day? We flew up to, to Dallas. I met with the search team and it was kind of a, a, a crazy day. We, we got, I got picked up at the airport. And if you have never driven around Dallas with a firefighter, Mark, Mark Good, I just, man, that was, that was my first experience. That, that, they, they know roads that I'm pretty sure aren't on maps. They, they know shortcuts and, and back ways and all these different things. It was awesome. We met, we met for lunch, and then we spent several hours with the search committee uh, just talking vision and philosophy and theology. It was a fantastic time. And, and honestly, that was the moment that day that cemented my love and my desire to serve the people of First Baptist Church here in Van. And so you didn't know it at that point, but from that day forward, I was committed to you. I loved you. I was praying for you. So they dropped me back off at the airport around 5 o'clock. I had a flight out at 7. Plenty of time to go through security and, and do all that. So I was sitting there ready to go and, and just thinking through the trip. I had it all planned out. If you know me by now, I'm a planner in the extreme. And so I, I had all the things worked out. Uh, God had a different plan that evening for us, though, because a storm front came through the area that stretched all the way from uh, about the middle of the state all the way up through, uh, through Oklahoma. And so we all looked at the screens and we saw the lightning and stuff outside. And I thought, I don't know if I'm going to get on a plane tonight. I don't, I don't know if it's going to happen. And we looked and one by one, all the flights said delay, 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 delay. And so I thought, okay, it's all right. I've got plenty of time. I've worked it all out. I didn't have any connecting flights. So I just had to get, a, uh, get to uh, the airport in Amarillo and then get, on, uh, get in my car and drive home. But then all of a sudden the delay went from 30 minutes to an hour. I thought, okay, it's getting in a little later, but I think we can still do this. And then two hours, and then three hours. And people were panicking. You've been in this situation, right? What do we do? The people who had connecting flights, it, it was, it was, they were trying to figure out, what are we going to do? I, I need to rent a car. I need to do this. People were going up to the, to the, the, the counter and yelling at the people you know, in, behind the counter. It's like, that's going to solve anything, right? It's not going to solve anything. They can't control the weather. Right? But they were screaming and trying to figure things out. People were desperate and panicking. There was a woman from Chicago who was a nurse who had come to visit a sick relative. And she needed to be back in Chicago that next morning at 7 a.m. for her shift. And so she was saying, i got to rent a car. i got to drive all the way through this storm all night and then get there and then work. Anyway, it was this, this terrible situation. And I sat there because I only had one flight. It wasn't a connecting flight. And I sat there and I did what... what you do at an airport, right? People watch. You meet some interesting people at the airport, right? That's some, I just want to look at people at the airport and say, where did you come from? I want, I want to know your story because it, it was, it, it must have been interesting to get you to this point. But I sat there and just kind of took it all in. I remember texting Kevin Reed and just saying, well, God gave me some extra time to, uh, to pray and to spend some time with him and people watch. But the lady that was a nurse, sat next to me and we had struck up a conversation and she said, how can you be so calm with all this happening? And I sat there, you know what I told her? Well, I'm an extraordinary person and I'm capable of <laughs> quite extraordinary things. No, I didn't tell her that. Did I, did I look at it? I'm glad you got that. It was a joke because that wasn't. I, I didn't look at her and I didn't say, well, I'm just a tough guy. I just make it through this situation. I just grip my teeth and, and just endure whatever life throws. I didn't say that. I didn't say I'm a weirdo who just likes to hang out at airports. I'm not going anywhere. I just want to see what's happening. No, what I told her is I don't believe that anything happens by accident. This, this isn't an accident. God is not in heaven looking, oh man, I sent that storm at the wrong time. That's, I don't know what to do now. Everything that happens in this life ha happens for a reason. And so I told her that and I said, I'm excited to find out what that reason is. Maybe the truth is maybe our plane would have gone down. I don't know. And maybe God's preventing that. Maybe, maybe it's the fact that that night I got to share the gospel with that woman. I never would have met her any other time in my life but in that place. And so I want to look at it like this. See, sometimes situations and circumstances come into our life and it creates worry and anxiety and stress. And the thing is, those situations do not make or break you. All they do is reveal what's already inside your heart. I want to talk this morning about how to deal with 
with some of those issues of, of anxiety and stress. And when we're in situations like this that kind of press on us and, and, and create anxiety in us. Now, I want, to, I'm gonna, I want you to follow me here. Is everybody with me? Okay. We can either be thermometers or thermostats in this world. Okay. Are you following me? You're like, oh, who knows where this is going? I don't know. Let's open our Bibles. Who, who's going? What does a thermometer do, church? It tells the temperature. So when it's hot outside, they go up. When it's cold, it, it, does that ever happen in, in East Texas? I'm pretty sure it doesn't. I met with Wade the other day, and he said, I'm just praying maybe that the temperature would go down a little. And I said, Mindy and I are praying. I'm sorry about this, but we're praying for a long, cold, bitter winter. So uh, I, I challenge you to outpray me on that. But, but when, when the thermometer just shows it. When, it. when it's hot, it just spikes. And when it's cold, it plummets. And people are like this. There's certain kinds of people that, that every time something good happens, oh, it's the best. It's just like, this is the best day. Right? I got that, I got that spot, spot right in front of Walmart. And it's like that spot that's never there. Somebody's always parked there, but I got it. And all of a sudden, it's the best day they've ever had. But then when something bad happens, they plummet into the depths of despair. And it's like... I, 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 it's just, it's crazy that the, the way that the pendulum swings with some people, that their circumstances hold them hostage sometimes. So that, that's, that's, therm, that's thermometers. What does a thermostat do? It controls the temperature. You, you and I are just like right, right there. We're on the same wavelength. It controls the temperature. So it doesn't, it doesn't tell you what the room is. It dictates what temperature the room will be. And this is the, the kind of life I think that God has created for us, where circumstances don't dictate our joy, but where circumstances don't affect us because we're rooted in something deeper. Right? We're not rooted. Our, our joy and our happiness and our life isn't rooted in the things that are always changing. They're rooted in the unchanging Christ who loves us and who gave himself for us. So Paul is going to show us. We're, we're going to be in Philippians 4. I am getting to Scripture. I promise it will be the center point of what I say this morning. Go with me to Philippians chapter 4. I need to slow down. I'm excited. I get excited when I read this pulpit church. So Paul, what he's going to do is he's going to show us, so how do I live like that? When, when bad things happen in my life, how do, I, how do I not let them destroy me? Like, like I see that happening all around the world. So he, he looks and he says, my, my hope, my joy has got to be rooted in something deeper. It's going to be rooted in contentment in Jesus Christ, no matter what happens in this life. You know what this reminds me of? Did you ever see the video, and I'm not going to get political, but you ever see, but I am, the, the video the day after Trump was elected, where there was people just like laying down in the streets and they were weeping and people were like screaming and, and it just, it was this moment, it's like, okay, if this is how you live your life, where when you don't get your way, you just absolutely break down, Right? Then, then this world is going to throw more trouble at you than who is going to be the president of the United States. What happens when, what happens when somebody in, in your family or what happens when you develop some kind of illness? That's going, to, that's going to absolutely destroy you. So what I want to do is focus us in here on the truth of Jesus Christ. Philippians chapter 4, we're going to start in verse 10. Stand with me when you have it. We're going to give honor to God's word. And I didn't mean to make fun of those people who were sad when President Trump was elected, but don't let your circumstances dictate, because that, that person will forever be known as the person who screamed into the camera on the day after the election, I don't know. But look at this, Philippians 4, we've been working our way through this chapter, now in verse 10, it's going to take a little bit of a turn, and so I want to I walk through this with you. It says this, I rejoiced in the Lord because once again, you renewed your care for me. We're going to talk about what that means. You were, in fact, concerned about me, but you lacked opportunity to show it. And this is what he says. I don't say this out of need, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I find myself in. I know both how to do, how to make do with little, and I know how to make do with a lot. In any and all circumstances, I've learned the secret of being content. Whether well-fed or hungry, whether in abundance or in need, I am able to do all things through him who strengthens me. Yeah. All right, let's pray, and then we're, gonna, we're really going to attack this, this section. 
Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for, for you, Lord. Sometimes we are so caught up with the blessings that we forget the blesser. Lord, you are good and gracious and kind, compassionate, holy and righteous, true. You are omnipotent. You have all power. You are omniscient. You have all wisdom and knowledge. You are omnipresent. You are everywhere all at once. There is no problem that faces us, Lord, that is too big for you. There is no issue or circumstance or situation that causes you concern because you are limitless. And I pray that as we look at our life and the things that threaten our peace, we would look not at our circumstances, but at you. Because it's you who gives us strength. Lord, it's you who, who bears our burdens through the hardest parts of our life. We cannot make it through this life without you. And there are people in our city right now and in our state and in this world struggling to make sense of a world without Christ in their hearts. And I pray that we would be the catalyst for them coming to faith in you. I pray that you would put it on us, Lord. It's such a burden on us to not keep our faith hidden between the hours of 10, 15, and 11, 30 on Sunday mornings, but that you would help us to live it out, that we'd be people of peace in this world. Thank you, Lord, for this passage of Scripture. I pray that it impacts our hearts. In your name we ask these things, Lord. Amen. All right, you can be seated. So let's jump into this, this passage. Walk with me. Go to verse 10 with me. And, and let's get a little bit of a background. So where is Paul when he is writing the book of Philippians, see if we remember where, where he was. I hear whispers. Say it loud. I, you're not wrong. Well, you may be. It depends on the answer. Prison. Prison. Good. He's in prison. Okay, so he is writing this from a position of prison. He was sent to prison in Rome, and you can read about that in Acts chapter 24 and 25. He's sent to prison because he broke a law. Why was he sent to prison? Preaching the gospel. He's sent to prison because he was doing what God had commanded him to do. So he's there. Some people think that he will never get out of prison. He was there in Rome in prison for at least two years. Some people think that's going to be the point where he's going to be executed for his faith. Others believe that he's going to make his way out of prison and then be executed at a later date. We know this, though, at the end of Paul's life, he's, he's going to be martyred for his faith. But he's been in prison in Rome at this point for a couple of years. And then we see something really cool happen in Philippians chapter 2. You guys can read that. I'm going to encourage you. It takes 10 minutes, 20 minutes to, to read the book of Philippians. Read the whole thing and kind of get some context. But in chapter 2, they send a man, the Philippian church sends a man named Epaphroditus. We always talked about that because Mindy's uh, maiden name was Epaphrod, so... They, they tried to trace their ancestry back to Epaphroditus. That was fun. Yeah, that was a funny thing. It's okay. I, I love when I say that. People are just like, was, that, was I supposed to laugh? No, I guess not. Um, so they sent this man. The Philippian church sends this man named Epaphroditus with food and supplies and money to the Apostle Paul in prison. Because here's the thing about prison, guys. They didn't feed you there. Okay? Today, like sometimes when you look at prison, it's like, that almost is better than my life right now. Like, you get cable TV for free and free health care, and you get food, and you get beat up on a daily basis, but that's beside the point. But in this situation, Paul is shackled and chained in between two Roman guards. They do not feed him. They do not clothe him. He relies on people on the outside. So all of a sudden, Paul opens his eyes in prison, and he sees Epaphroditus coming in his door with food and supplies and different things. This is awesome. So this is how he responds in verse 10. Can you imagine that? imagine being in that situation and you see somebody that you know and they're bringing the exact things that you need. Ah, oh, that would have been such a moment to see. And it says in verse 10, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly because of you. Now think about this situation. Where is he when he's writing this? Prison. And he's literally, the Bible says shackled. So it's, it's, it's these iron uh, shackles are wearing away at his wrists and he's, he's dirty and he's, he's it just, it's this desperate situation. You know what he could have told the Philippian church? Why am I having to go through this? Guys, this is awful. This is the worst. I, I, I'm preaching the gospel. God, I'm, I'm doing exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. Why am I here? Why do I have to suffer like this? But instead, he's going to give you a glimpse into the Apostle Paul's heart. He looks at these Philippian believers and he's like, I am filled with so much joy 
when I saw that man coming through that door with supplies on me. And it wasn't, who, who was he filled with joy in? In Epaphroditus? What does your Bible say in verse 10? In the Lord. He knew that it came from God, right? And so he looks and he, and he tells him, you can read all about the, the situation there in Philippians chapter two, but somewhere along the way, between when Epaphroditus left Philippi and got to the Apostle Paul in Rome, something happened to him that almost cost him his life. It, it was a situation, we don't know if he was attacked and maybe almost died, we don't know if he contracted an illness or something, but he was on his deathbed. So literally, he comes stumbling through the door almost dead, and Paul takes care of him. I love this, this great reversal. Paul takes care of him, and then sits down, writes this letter, the letter to the church at Philippi, the book of Philippians, gives it to Epaphroditus and says, go home, back to Philippi, give this letter to the church. Thank you. So he sends them back. We owe so much to this man named Epaphroditus because he faithfully carried that letter back to the church, and then it was spread from there, and we hold it in our hands today. I love the, the theme of this, but Paul, he shouldn't have been rejoicing, he should have been complaining. And you guys have read those posts on Facebook, haven't you? When somebody has a bad day, and we all hear about it, and we're like, this isn't a personal diary, like, are you just wanting sympathy? Because sometimes it starts out like, well, let me tell you about my day, and then it, it's like six paragraphs of of all the bad that's happening. And I do feel bad when people go through bad days. But listen, if that's what defines you, then we've got a serious problem in our hearts. Because that, that means we've rooted ourselves and our, and our peace in our circumstances and not in Christ. And so Paul here, he shows us the way. He says, I, I was filled with so much joy when Epaphroditus came through the door. He uses this word, look at this word, when he says, I rejoice in the Lord greatly, once again, because you renewed your care for me. Let me tell you about that word renewed. This is, this is neat. It describes, it's, it only appears here. It doesn't appear anywhere else in the Bible. But it describes flowers blooming after a long winter. Okay, yeah, so the Greeks had a word, one word <laughs> that described flowers blooming after winter. What does that tell you if you look out and you see flowers bloom? Spring. Like winter's over. And, and it's funny how we go through these kind of things because like at the end of summer, we're like, if it, if it could just be under 90 just for one day, like I would appreciate that. But then at the end of a long winter, I grew up in Michigan, so we understand long winters. It's like nine months out of the year. And so at the end of a long winter, you see uh, the robins come back. That, that was our, our sign when you see flowers blooming. It just means, thank goodness, the, the temperature's going to get above freezing. So that's what Paul is saying to Epaphroditus and to the Philippian church. Like, you guys, you're, what it means to me is that, that this long, dry winter, it's over. And now I have blessings from the Lord. And this is what it's going to teach us. There's two things I want you to see in terms of what he says here. Number one is this. In the good times, rejoice in Christ's provision. That's number one. I'll give you some time to write those words. I know I, I gave you 400 blanks. Today to fill in, in the good times, rejoice in Christ's provision. So he says, I rejoice in the Lord. He recognizes every good thing comes from God. Everything that you have in your life. And we take so much for granted, church. Look up at me. We, we take so much for granted. You, you look at, we live better than 99% of the people in this world. The, the fact that you, you are here today, you, the, the fact that we have electricity in this place, and it's probably not going to go off at any point during this, although now that I said that, right? The fact that you probably drove a car here today from a house that you may own or, or you may be renting, the fact that, that we, we eat better than most of the world, we're so blessed. And so Paul teaches us here, it is okay to rejoice in God's blessings. That's, that's, that's great. Paul's like, man, this is, this is a great day that you, you refreshed me, you renewed your care for me. This is an awesome thing, but we've got to remember where those blessings came from. Paul understands he didn't earn this, right? He didn't, he didn't say, it's about time, Epaphroditus. Like, you, you should have come a long time ago. I've been hungry for a while. I wanted those, you know, on the mission field growing up. We loved when people would send care packages to us because it would include sometimes things that we couldn't get. Peanut butter was one of them. Like, America is like the only country that eats peanut butter. And so you, when you go a long time, even if you don't like peanut butter, you go a long time without it, your mouth just craves it. And they would send me Mountain Dew. All right, that's, 
that's my jam. I just, I, I would go two years without it and I'd get a care package. I wouldn't even care if it didn't have any more fizz in it. I didn't even care. It just, I just wanted the taste of it, right? And that's Paul. He's saying, man, I'm so blessed. I'm rejoicing because God takes care of his children. Church, does God take care of you? Yeah, he does. Uh, Jesus himself looked in Matthew 6 and he said, he takes, God takes care of the sparrows. Who don't, they, don't, they don't reap, they don't harvest, they don't sow, they don't work. But God takes care of them. How much more is he going to take care of us? When we go through those bad times, part of having contentment and peace is looking back at the good times and saying, God, you carried me through before, you'll carry me through again. Trusting in the Lord. So I rejoice in the good times, rejoicing in Christ's provision. But now let's get to the fun part. Because that's easy, isn't it? When things are going well, when everybody is healthy in your home and you've got enough in the bank account to pay your bills and cars are both gassed up and everything's going good, it, that's not hard to say thank you, Lord, is it? I don't think there's anybody that stops and is like, mm, gosh, I don't think I can thank him for those. Yeah, obviously we thank the Lord. But how about this number two, in bad times, be satisfied in Christ's strength. So in the good times, rejoice in Christ's provision. In bad times, be satisfied in Christ's strength. So he tells them this in verse 10. He said, I rejoice because you renewed your care for me. And then in verse 11, he makes sure to say this. He makes sure to put this in. I don't say this out of need. He's saying, I'm not telling you this so that you keep sending care packages. Like, I don't want Epaphroditus to almost die again. Like, I am okay with what I have right now. He says, for I have learned to be content. Church, if there is a word that America needs to learn today, I think this may be it. I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I find myself. Okay, picture this with me. We're going to go off on a little rabbit trail. Let's well, not around trail, it's somebody else, but picture this. We're sitting here in church, everything's going good, and a meteorite just like smashes through the ceiling and like destroys the piano. Carol, you're still okay, but your piano's gone. Okay. <laughs> How are we gonna react to that? You like this? Wow. That was unexpected. <laughs> Hope we got insurance on that. Yeah, no, no, it would freak us out. Right? What in the world has happened? What are we going to do? It would create panic in here. And so what Paul is doing here, he uses a word here that would have caused the believers to react in the same way. It's like a meteorite that hits the context of this. And the word is content. So again, this word only shows up in, in the Bible right here. The word content in Greek. It only shows up right here. And it is not a biblical word. Word. You know, you go to church for long enough, you, you learn Christianese. Like you learn all the, all the things. You learn words like atonement and sanctification. Like you learn all of these different words. And people that come in from the outside are like, I don't know what those words mean. Well, this word is not a Bible word. The word content. So it was a philosophical term. There was a group of people called the Stoics. Okay? Tell me you got some English majors out here. What does the word Stoic mean? I know it's been a while since English 101, right? Stoic. I know you're saying it. You just don't want to get it wrong in front of everybody. That's okay. So there's a group of people called the Stoics. Stoic means like stone-faced, uh, immobile, immovable, uh, I don't show emotion. So there was a group of people that had their philosophy of, I, I have to go through life and I cannot show emotion. So that was this group of people called the Stoics, and they just gritted their teeth. They endured life. Like, they weren't allowed to have fun at all. They just, they just lived. If anything good happened, good. If anything bad happened, it's all right. And that's how they lived their life. They were masters of themselves. And, and so Paul takes this idea, right, and he kidnaps it from them, and he gives it to the church. This is one of the coolest things that Paul does, and he does this frequently. He takes foreign pagan ideas, and he says, nope, I'm going to repurpose that. For, for Christ. You've seen people who, who take old furniture and they repaint it and they redo it and now it's like an end table. And you're like, wow, that was 
like a toilet at one point, and now it's an end table. I don't know how you did that. But so that's what Paul's doing. He takes this and drops it into the church, and he says, no longer are you guys going to live life like this, like just stone-faced enduring, because you're strong. Now we have a different source of strength that's going to allow us to make it through this world and all the bad things that happen. Right? It's Christ at the center of all things. You're not self-sufficient anymore. You're Christ sufficient. And he explains what he means. He says here in verse 11, I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I find myself. All right? That's easy to say when things are good, right? I'm, I'm real content. But look at this. I've learned how to make do with little. He says, when I'm in prison and I'm shackled here and I've got nothing and my stomach is rumbling and, and I can see my ribs and I don't know what to do. He says, I have learned to be content with little, and I've also learned how to make do with a lot. In any and all circumstances, I've learned the secret of being content, whether well-fed or hungry, whether in abundance or in need. So he's saying that I don't swing like a pendulum. In the good times, I'm not crazy overjoyed. In the bad times, I'm not in the depths of despair. Why? Because my hope and my vision and my joy, my peace, aren't rooted in the things around me. Who are they rooted in, church? In Christ. Look at verse 13. This is where I want to camp out for the rest of this. All right? Because I think we have done a tremendous amount of damage to verse 13. I can do all things in Him who strengthens. Where have you heard that before? Where haven't you heard that before? That's the question. Maybe in church. That's the one place that we probably haven't heard it. I've seen it. When I was in high school, it was above. It was written above our weight room. And that was like our mantra when we were lifting. It's like, I need to get to 350 because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mess up some worldviews this morning. I'm going to step on some toes because we have used this so wrong, okay? Uh, so we've also, I've seen this on, on the t-shirts of people running marathons. I can do this through Christ who strengthens me. This is the best place that I heard this verse. At a restaurant called Carlos O'Kelly's in Wichita, Kansas, they had a five pound burrito challenge. A five pound burrito challenge. And below it were the words, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Okay, and I'm, I'm not, I'm not, that was a joke, but no, it was real, but I, I'm not trying to make fun of this because we have kidnapped this verse from its context. We have turned this into a verse of personal achievements. Like, well, I can do it. If I want to fly a plane, I'm, I'm just going to get in the cockpit in 413 and all the way, you know, to Malibu, whatever it is. We, but the thing is, our kid Hughes, he, this is what he said, if you want to fly a plane, go to flight school, right? Don't get in the cockpit of my plane Muttering the words of Philippians 4.13. It's not about achievements. It's not about personal glory. It's not about God being a steroid that you inject with Philippians 4.13. And then all of a sudden I can do all things. The way that we have typically used this. And I'm, and I'm sorry if I'm, I'm breaking your heart with this verse. I'm not though. Because I want to be biblical with this. The, the way that we've used this is the pathway to worry and anxiety and stress. Because what happens if you invoke Philippians 4.13 and then you fail? Who was it strong enough? If I can do all things through Christ and I don't lift what I want to and I don't run as fast as I want to and I can't finish that five pound burrito, I probably could, but if I, if I invoke those words like some kind of magic ceremony and then I fail, that means Christ wasn't strong enough for me. Right? It either means Christ wasn't strong enough or I'm a failure. And all this creates is stress and worry and anxiety over and over and over. But if you take this verse and you put it back in its context, church, context is key. So context, here's my easiest definition of context for us. What comes before and what comes after. Okay? We do this all the time with verses. We, we snatch them out of the context. We make them say what we want. And then we go our way. But look at this. Paul, when he says, I can do all things through Christ, is he talking about flying a plane? Is he talking about eating a five-pound burrito? Is he talking about lifting weights? Is he talking about running a race? No, look what he's talking about. He just told us what he's talking about. Verse 11 and 12. I've learned how to make do with little. I've learned how to make do with a lot. In any and all circumstances, I've learned the secret of being content 
Whether well-fed or hungry, whether in abundance or in need, I'm able to do all things through him who strengthens me. So what are those all things? The little and the lot. Hunger and being well-fed. Abundance or need. That's what he's talking about. He's saying, I can do all these things. I cannot let my circumstances dictate my joy because it's not the world that gives me joy. It's Christ. I'm centered in him. I'm centered in him. And you know, when you see a person or maybe you are a person who, who deals with heavy anxiety, it's, it's an indication of something deeper going on. It's an indication that we at a heart level have a problem in trusting in God's provision. Now, I am not talking about clinical anxiety. I want to make that very clear. I'm not talking about emotional problems because there's a difference between having worry and there's a difference between being clinically and medically anxious, right? One needs therapy and, and, uh, and medication. The other needs scripture, right? We stop and we look and say, Christ, if you are my strength, if you are my focus, then the good things that happen in my life, they're great. But they don't define me. I'm not defined by my blessings. I'm not defined by being an American. I'm not defined by where I live in East Texas, although it is the best place to live in the world. Okay, But that doesn't define me. What defines me is Christ and His strength. If I have a bad day and, and things are bad, yeah, but when Christ is my focus... Those bad days, they don't define me. The cancer, it doesn't define you. The, the broken marriage, the divorce, it doesn't define you. The, the death in your family, listen to me, it doesn't define you. What defines you is Christ. And he is strong enough to lead us through the storms in this life. I'm going to give you a challenge before I end this morning. Be a thermostat. Do not be a thermometer. Don't let this world just push you in every single direction. Paul even said that. He said some people are, are, are living their lives like, like grass being blown in the wind. Like wherever the wind blows, that's where they're going to go. Instead, be rooted in Christ. Decide now to be content in Christ. Because whatever Christ gives you, the good things, the blessings that you enjoy in this life, you know why they're given to you? Because you're awesome and you deserve them? No. They're given to you because Christ wants you to love Him, glorify Him, and be holy before Him. The bad things in your life, do you know why they were given to you? Because Christ wants you to love Him, obey Him, be holy before Him. If it comes into your life, that means it came first from the hand of God. And he has a purpose behind it. Like me sitting in the airport. right? It wasn't just to annoy anybody or ruin people's vacation plans. It was because of, of a specific reason. So be content with where Christ puts you. Now that doesn't mean you can't ever be happy or sad. Like I, I hope people don't home and be like, I'm not allowed to be sad anymore. Like if my dog dies today, I'm not allowed to. I'm not, I just have to be like, mm, pastor said I had to just be okay with it. No, it's not about that, right? It's about finding joy and finding strength in Jesus and not in what happens in this world. But let me tell you this. I'm going to invite our praise team to come forward. Not, I've said this every week of this series. None of this matters if you do not know Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. You, you can't find peace in your heart, in your life, and in your soul outside of a relationship with Jesus Christ. That, that's in your marriage. If you're struggling right now with some issues in your marriage, it will not be fixed by my sermon. It's going to be fixed by Christ's real presence in your marriage. If you've got problems with your kids, you've got problems at work, whatever it may be, if you've got turmoil in your heart, it won't be fixed by trying all these different things. It's going to be fixed by coming to Jesus, accepting Him as your personal Lord and Savior, giving your heart to Him. So I'm going to invite you to do this this morning. We're all going to close our eyes, bow our heads. As the musicians sing this morning, I'm going to invite you, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, I'm going to invite you to come figure out what that means this morning. There's a holy God who loves you, who wants you to be saved, but in our sin and shame and guilt, we've separated ourselves from Him. But He provided a way to come back to Him, to be forgiven. 
and to enjoy his presence and his blessings again. And that is through what Jesus did for us on the cross. He took your place. He took the punishment we deserve so that we could enjoy his presence forever. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, if you've never made that choice, or maybe you made it when you were a little kid and it just wasn't real for you, and you want to make that clear today, I'm going to invite you while we sing to come forward, come talk to me and see what, what that means. Father, thank you so much for this church. Thank you that it is a place where we stand on Scripture, where we're going to put it into its context. We're going to teach it as it was, as it was given to the church at Philippi. Lord, I pray that we would look at you this morning. And if there's somebody in this room that doesn't know you, doesn't have a relationship with you, Lord, that they would fall before you, consecrate their hearts to you and be forgiven. Jesus, you are, you are our root. You are our foundation. I want to build my life on you. I want to seek you. When the storms come, I want it to be you that sustains me. So I ask you to give us peace. In Jesus' name, we ask you to